I see everyone's trickling in. So I know we were talking about that awkward noise before uh, the Big Data Cup starts, but we will start in approximately four minutes. So thank you everyone for starting to come in and we'll get right into the introductions uh, right on the hour. Great, I see a lot more people trickling in. Welcome, uh, we will start in about a minute just to let a few more people come in, but just really appreciate you spending our Friday night with us at the Big Data Cup. I know sometimes people, you know, have, have jokes about hockey analytics, but I think not only is it growing, I think there's a lot of interest from all sorts of different uh, sectors and into what's going on in hockey, technology and everything to do with data. So I think that we're all here on a Friday night really helps that argument as well. So really appreciate all your attendance and you know, hope you have an enjoyable time that you learn something and that you know, overall you have fun. So a giant welcome to everyone, everyone involved, all the presenters, the judges, obviously thank you to Shirley, Michael and Allison who'll be taking the baton from me and will guide you through these presentations tonight. This event is being recorded for viewing later as well. So if you have to jump off or you wanna watch later, you're more than welcome to. If you want to tweet, please hashtag BDC2021 on Twitter, or you can ask Q and A's if you want to engage uh, with the presentations. They won't be judged on it, but you can you know, talk to them in the chat uh, box as well. But also please adhere to our code of conduct for behavior, it's on the website. Uh, and we expect respect obviously from everyone. First off, I think we all knew that there's amazing people, students, executives, analysts out there doing great work. So it is truly my privilege that you've worked with Staffleet's data set. This is a very small sample of what we usually collect game to game. So we were overwhelmed by the quality of submissions. And I have definitely driven, driven everyone in my office crazy, Brad and Dom especially with getting this up. Uh, you know, so really excited to have this tonight. 
Also want to say thanks to CBC Sports, NWHL, the Erie Otters, and everyone who has supported our women's initiative. Uh, the women's data will stay online and will be, even be added to this weekend with the Isabel Cup on NBC so we can continue to research in the women's game. Um, and thanks again to the Erie Otters who are truly a world-class organization for helping us with the scouting data. Yet over the 70 submissions, 34 were on the women's data. So thank you endlessly. I know there's a huge market for not only women's sports, but women's analysts. So really appreciate that engagement. Uh, you know, please do research and submit and write blog posts and do everything with that women's data. It's re really meaningful to me uh, and keep asking for more. We want to do more. We want to post more on the website uh, for you to work in women's hockey. So importantly as well, uh, we have prizes for the winner of the Big Data Cup. In total, 4,000 in cash will be given away uh, from Canadian Statistical Science Institute and School of Math and Stats and Institute uh, for Data Science at Carleton U and Math, Computer Science and Stats at St. Lawrence U. And the very generous donations from many of our NHL and WHL uh, and college as well, St. Lawrence, which you saw, I snuck a couple games of St. Lawrence hockey, women's hockey as well into the data set. Uh, these include signed jerseys, pucks, memorabilia. So really appreciate it. Here were all our judges. We had so many NHL teams, the league, executives, some of the best judges in the world in terms of sports stats, in my opinion, as well. They helped, helped with mentorship. So people that took on office hours, I've highlighted them as well. Endless thank you for you know, all your generosity, your time. I know we've all appreciated it. And I got so many good responses as you know, I've met new friends through this. This has helped me through the pandemic. I've actually used some of the courses that I've learned in the past year in this. So it's been, I've been very overwhelmed um, by the response and by the number of submissions. Tonight, we have a great list of judges. Uh, first off, Asma Toomey, uh, you know her from Hockey Graphs, but she's also a director of analytics at Pursue Care. Uh, so she's in, you know, health data science as well as a big data bowl finalist. So she was exactly in your shoes. We are so happy to have her as one of the judges. Next up, we have Brian McDonald, special faculty in sports analytics at CMU. You also know him from the Florida Panthers previously and ESPN. Then we have Rachel Dory, a master's student at York in sports and a former New Jersey, Anal New Jersey Devils analyst. Of course, we have Chris Baker. The NHL as a league has been incredibly supportive. Uh, we have another judge tomorrow uh, for the college from them as well. He is a stats analyst at the NHL, as well as an author of a book, Hockey Analytics, that I saw quite referenced quite often in your papers. So lovely to have him along. And then last but not least, we have Eric Telsky. Obviously he's been integral in putting Hockey Analytics on the map. Now as the AGM of the Carolina Hurricanes, he's definitely a huge fan favorite. So we really feel like we have an all-star judge tonight. And to all the judges, we hope you are hard but fair, but I do not envy being in your shoes. Uh, the winners will be announced at the end of the conference tomorrow. Good luck to everyone. I really hope we have a fun night. I will throw it over to Allison. Uh, there'll be 15 minutes to present each of the team's findings. These were chosen randomly the order and then 10 minutes of questions from our esteemed judges. Really excited. Thank you again from the bottom of my heart, not just from a company, but from a person. This is really meaningful to see this. So I appreciate it a ton. Allison. Thank you so much, Megan. I would just like to echo Megan's thanks and appreciation for everyone who has made not just this competition possible, but this evening possible to share the results and, and learn from one another and, and make our ideas grow and make this sport better. Um, no one needs to listen to me as was already highlighted. If you do have questions as our finalists present, please feel free to use the Q&A function in Zoom. We will use those questions as a supplement to the questions that first come from our evaluating judges. Our presenters will each have 15 minutes to go through their findings. I'm going to introduce first Greg Ackerman, who will be speaking on evaluating the 2019-20 Erie Otters through Markov models. Greg, I will turn the floor over to you. The host needs to unstop my video. 
Um, can you see my screen? We can, Greg, it looks great. Awesome. So, uh, hi, my name is Greg Ackerman, and this is my research project evaluating the 2019-20 Uri Otters through Markov models. Um, so the goals of my research are to quantify uh, play buildup towards a goal. Um, the hockey analytics community has, can you like see the, I like see my, I see everyone. Uh, can you see that or is it? We see your slide, including the QR code at the bottom. Yep. All right. Um, so um, the goal of my research is quantify build up towards a goal. The hockey analytics community has made uh, great strides in expected goals and also possession based metrics over the years, but there's still a desire to understand uh, plays that lead up to goals. So I aim to measure how valuable it is to advance the puck to maybe a more favorable scoring zone. And also uh, how can we uh, apply this to a scouting team? Um, the problem is pretty hard to solve. Hockey is a complex game uh, with a lot of moving parts. So analysts and scouts struggle um, to objectively evaluate the incremental value of a play uh, towards a goal. Hockey is also a free flowing game. So uh, something like bucketing passes into completions and incompletions uh, will remove the fact that the team is actually advancing the puck uh, towards the goal and that they also might be maintaining possession, maybe a, a puck will hit off of a skate and go uh, behind the opposing goal. Um, to help evaluate play buildup, we call upon our great friend, uh, Andre Markov, not the two-time all-star Canadians defenseman, but the Russian mathematician known for his work on stochastic processes. Uh, Markov chains describe a sequence of possible events in which the probability of each event depends only on the state uh, attained in the previous event. So uh, Markov chains can be useful in handling play sequences of any length and uh, can look at all the possible ways a play can unfold. The one notable downside here is that Markov chains um, are, uh, they assume independence. So when in reality, hockey plays do depend on prior passes at the leading up to it, uh, the Markov chain only cares about the previous play. Um, before I go further into my presentation, I'd like to take a minute and talk about some of the work I read um, on markup chains in soccer and football. That was really helpful. So uh, Sarah Rudd, who's now of Arsenal, introduced markup chains for play buildup at the 2011 Nessus conference. Uh, she used stat DNA data. Derek Yam, who's now of the Baltimore Ravens, extended Rudd's work uh, using stats bombs data. And those were really good. They impl implemented um, uh, zones and pressure uh, on soccer data. Um, in American football, Keith Goldner, who is now FanDuel, used Markov chains to evaluate the likelihood of a play ending in a touchdown, field goal, turnover, or any other uh, football outcome. And Ron Yurko reproduced his paper in 2018 for his Carnegie Mellon students. And his code and analysis were really helpful um, in building out my idea. Uh, so my play progression model has two absorption states, which are a goal or a change in possession. And the, once an absorption state is entered in the Markov chain, it cannot be left, which is uh, the reasoning for why I used actual goals scored uh, more favorably than something such as an, a variant of expected goals at some sort of cutoff. So uh, leading up to an absorption state can be any number of transient states, which are just uh, geographic zones, which I'll show you on the next slide, such as the inner slot point, uh, et cetera. So um, for the research, I limited the data to just even strength uh, five versus five play. And uh, once again, the Markov chain assumes the memory list property. So the Markov chain doesn't really care about the events leading up to the puck arriving, say, to the West Point um, per se. So uh, moving forward, uh, these are the geographic zones. So 
Um, I actually took these from the Columbus Blue Jackets Hockey Analytics Conference. Um, so if anyone watched that, it's exactly the same. So uh, intuitively getting to the slot is more valuable than uh, to the point, but getting opportunities there is more difficult. Uh, so players will need to pass the puck along the boards and back towards the point and potentially sending the puck to a worse zone. Um, otherwise they might commit a turnover in their attempts and uh, their team will lose possession. So uh, for the mathematically inclined, here's how I calculated the probability of goal or possession change. So the transition matrix has N transient states, which are the 23 play sections I just showed. You'll see that more in the coming slides. R is the absorbing states, which in my case is R2, the goal or a possession change. Q is the matrix of transition probabilities. Um, Q is the product of little n and little n. R is a matrix containing the absorption probabilities. R is little n by little r. Big N is known as the fundamental matrix and is calculated as the inverse to the n uh, by n matrix, identity matrix, I, um, so minus the transition matrix, which is Q. Uh, so with this, I was able to calculate the probability of a goal or a possession change um, using the big, the product of the big N and the big R matrix. So now that I've bored you with the math, it's actually a fairly uh, simple concept. So the probabilities of play leading in a goal are shown to the left as you progress um, in a play, maybe a pass to another pass, a zone entry to a pass. Um, and unsurprisingly, the likeliest goals, likely zones to result in goal are the crease and slot areas. With these values, I match the goal probabilities to the Otters plays to start analyzing how the Otters players uh, contributed to their goal scored in the 2019-20 season, even though these probabilities also did include um, their opponent's data as well. So for the purpose of this and rewarding play progression, I simply define a goal contribution as the incremental change in goal probability from the current state to the next state. So uh, for example, pass from the east outer slot to the inner slot results in a 6.5% um, increase in goal probability. If a player results in a goal, it reaches absorption, which means it's 100% likely to be a goal, it is a goal. Um, and as a result, plays that maintain possession in the defensive zone result in fairly small goal contributions, while successful plays in the offensive zone will lead to higher swings in goal probability. So here's an example of a play of Daniel Singer's goal from the 20, from September 2019. Uh, Jamie Drysdale recovered a puck uh, behind his own goal, and then he swung a pass uh, along the left board that was actually marked by Staples as incomplete, but it was recovered by his teammate Daniel Singer um, in the neutral zone. So while it was incomplete, I still rewarded him a positive goal contribution just so slightly. Uh, then he took the puck uh, recovery to his own entry, which is an increase in 1.4% uh, goal probability. And going from the uh, blue line towards the inner slot uh, was an increase in goal probability by 10.8%. And 86.3% represents the change in probability from the inner slot to the goal. So here are the Otters net goal contributions. Um, if you looked at their point totals at all or whatnot, they did have a fairly uh, top heavy lineup. Chad Yetman and Maxime Golode um, were the team's top scorers by far. And Jamie Drysdale was a top notch and NHL prospect. So not too surprising to see those guys at the top here. I included the number of events um, for each player and around like here. So um, we could see Daniel Singer had a much smaller uh, sample of plays than guys like Yetman and Drysdale, but uh, he did perform well in that short, short stint. While someone like Brendan Kishnick had a short, small sample and Noah Sidor at the bottom there um, had a small sample and they performed um, a little worse in contributing to their team's goals in those small samples. Uh, so I could further break it down by uh, contribution type. 
So goals contribution, goal contributions are unsurprisingly influenced heavily by the shooting component, which is made up of goals and shots. Uh, we see that Max Gallad was um, a uh, strong positive impact in passing and uh, increasing goal probability. And uh, that's pretty unsurprising with his body assist totals. Uh, what's interesting is Jamie Drysdale was only a 3.8% shooter, uh, but he rated very highly in terms of his shooting component. Uh, in Corey Pryman's scouting report of Drysdale, he noted that Drysdale frequently attempted to find his teammates sticks for deflections. So uh, I thought it was worthwhile to investigate um, how he arrives at this really strong uh, shooting number. And uh, what's important to note too for these contributions is that they are unadjusted for teammates, play type, age, zone starts, positions. So more work is necessary to properly understand maybe those contributions. And uh, these contributions are only uh, towards incrementally adding to the probability of a goal scored. So maybe Jack Duff uh, at the bottom there isn't really a strong contributor to attacking contributions, but I'm not, but he could be a good player in his defensive zone contributing defensively. So I'm not too worried about that for what I am working on. So, and also, uh, it is also, it is difficult to positively pass plays in the offensive zone. You'll commit turnovers and whatnot. So that's why a lot of the passing numbers are negative, but doesn't necessarily mean they are, um, they are our worst players. And maybe uh, Connor Lockhart had a poor shooting um, component, but he performed okay compared to some other guys in the other play types. So um, maybe, and he was also uh, an underager at the, for the Otters. So maybe I'd pick him over Brendan Kishnick or something based off of uh, some more context. So um, to look further into shooting, I examined two forwards and two defensemen. So Chad Yetman led the team in goals and he shot a strong 12% um, at even, this is all even strength and about 9% more of his shots uh, that did not go in were covered by a teammate as opposed to an opponent. Connor Lockhart shot only 4.3% as a forward and more of his non-goals resulted in opponent recoveries than eerie recoveries. The role of shooting for forwards is much different than defensemen even strength. So defensemen are nearly always shooting from a low goal probability area. So while they are shooting for goals, their job is also to set up teammates and uh, deflections in superior scoring chances that they won't get to finish. Uh, so Jamie Drysdale had a low shooting percentage as do most defensemen, but 53% of his shots generated rebounds for Erie. And the goal contribution model rewarded him quite handsomely as his team maintained possession in, um, in, like, in those like their scoring areas. So Jack Duff had a worse shooting percentage than Drysdale and his rebounds weren't recovered by Otters players as frequently. Um, so we can look at some shot charts actually. And uh, here's Jack Duff's. And uh, we see a lot of triangles. So as a defenseman, he's shooting into a lot of traffic, uh, but we do see more red, um, which, in this case is an opponent recovery or a stoppage. So uh, moving on to Jamie Drysdale's shot chart, we see more blue, which means the Erie players are recovering his shots and uh, they're coming in front of 81%, 81, 81% of his shots come in front of traffic. So he's really trying to get deflections and, and uh, puck to the goal. And um, that's why we see the non goal shot contribution uh, to be pretty high on his front. And he did score a few goals too, so that's why it's overwhelmingly a positive. Uh, Connor Lockhart is performed poorly in shooting as a forward. And we do see a lot um, of, we see a lot of shots without traffic, which is more typical of a forward, but very few of them went in. And um, there were more eerie, there are more opponent coveries than eerie recoveries. And lastly, we'll look at Chad Yetman, who was the who scored a bunch of goals at even strength for the Otters. And um, he shot with traffic, without traffic. Um, and uh, he was, he's right, he has a right-handed shot, so he scored a little bit more to the right side. But um, 
definitely a better shooter than Lockhart last year. And, um, and the results of the Markov chain uh, quantified that. So uh, in summary, I think the mark that Markov chains are useful in hockey. Markov chains handle the hockey play sequences of uh, varying lengths and in a fairly simple fashion. And um, I, it's also interpretable by looking at the uh, play in that zone uh, and further breaking it down by passing, shooting and whatnot. So um, the downside of using the Markov chain is that I'm stripping uh, a lot of context by using binning all the offense into zones. So um, we know from expected goals models that a shot five feet from the net is probably going to be worth more than 15 feet, but it could be in the same uh, zone. So um, that's a strategic downfall of what I was going for. Um, and I also think this was seen in the soccer papers that I did mention that defensive pressure or uh, contextual data such as um, playing on the rush and whatnot can be really helpful in improving the geographic zones. Because I think if you are in the inner slot, but you have four defenders breathing down your neck, you might have a guy wide open in the outer slot. So um, if we did know the defensive pressure, it would be pretty helpful in knowing that uh, moving from a zone with pressure to without pressure, and maybe that um, negative goal contribution would be positive in reality. Um, that's it. Um, and I'm ready for some questions. Fantastic, Greg. Thank you so much. I will invite any of our judges who are comfortable to turn on their video as well as we look for questions from our judges. So Chris, Rachel, Brian, Asma, Eric, uh, what questions do you have for Greg? Who wants to start? Um, I, I have a couple. First one was, Greg, did you consider um, training on the opponent data and then using that so that you're not like biasing uh, you know, your, your baselines are, are kind of caked into how you're evaluating the individual players. Um, um, I didn't really too much, put too much consideration to there. Um, and yeah, 50% of the data was eerie data, but um, I was most concerned about having a fairly even amount of plays between all the zones uh, and get a, generate a good probability there. Um, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's it is shooting towards the goal and um but it definitely is a wish that i could have had some more data away from the otters but um based off of what i was given it wasn't the biggest concern yeah that's a it's a fair response Uh, I'll go ahead, Greg. That was a really great presentation, and I thought it was really clever, your use of Markov chains for this. Uh, I was wondering if you tested your metrics for repeatability and if you had any idea on um, how soon the metrics stabilize over a season. Um, yeah, it was. Um, I didn't do too, too much outside of just validating um, through cross-validation if um, the uh, if a shot was, if it was pre actually predicting goals, which uh, those numbers did, were at a pretty strong correlation, but um, at a game to game level, it was, um, I didn't do too much in terms of the, um, I didn't do too much in terms of how long it took to stabilize. So, um, but at a game by game level, it, you were able to see um, the top players putting up uh, nicer goal contribution numbers than uh, their teammates. So it, I think it does take a little longer to stabilize, but I uh, am guessing on that. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, that was uh, that was uh, interesting paper and uh, talk. I just had a quick 
question of clarification and another question. So the table that you showed um, that showed like probability of goal 31.8% or whatever uh, for crease, yeah. So this is, what is exactly the interpretation of this again? Is this the probability that it's, this is not that the next event will be a goal. This is that the absorbing state will be a goal. Yes, um, that the possession that's currently existing will absorb in a goal. Okay. So then the probability of turnover would be 68. I, I don't know if I can subtract 100 from that, but um, 68.4 or 2.2. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, had you thought about did you consider using shots as an absorbing state? And, you know, what would be the, would that be possible? What would the drawbacks or benefits of, of that be? I'm just curious. Um, yeah, I considered it. And um, one, we didn't have um, an expected goals model. So it would be, if you could say this is biased towards the otters, it would be even more bias towards the otters doing an expected goals metric there. So um, I uh, didn't really have, I had a, a quick one that I drew up, but I felt that um, using actual goals would be um, a better reference to go off of and, um, and it would have less binning uh, than I already had within um, the than I already was doing, so. Um, okay, cool, thanks. Greg, I've got a question for you. Um, if you could go to the slide that has uh, the contributions, that one, yes, perfect. Uh, so you talked about Drysdale and how his shooting was really high and then you mentioned that uh, it was likely due to the deflections and rebounds. When you were, I guess, categorizing the data, did you choose to make uh, shots that created rebounds as part of the shooting bin or um, were they already there for you? I'm only curious because I know um, team C, sometimes when we evaluate, we look at uh, that we shoot for a rebound as a pass type of situation. So I'm wondering if maybe that, um, we could use that as an evaluation. Did you think about that at all or was that already done for you? Um, yeah, I, the thought behind it was if the puck was on goal in a shot, um, but a teammate recovers the shot, it, the possession doesn't really end. So um, I didn't really um, create any additional shot variables. It was just, um, the possession uh, did not end, and um, the deep, the dives I took after um, into the data was uh, completely separate. Just diving into the uh, raw data to hopefully explain why uh, Drysdale uh, had such a high shooting component. Greg, I guess the, the other question that I had is, did you consider uh, the time between zones as a as a potentially a proxy for determining rush plays? Where um, I yeah, it was, I was going on a, I was going on a tangent and looking to try to make um, rush plays into a, um, into a transient state. So it was, uh, I was going off of the rules that uh, Warren Ice actually created for their rebound shot metrics, and uh, it was just pretty tough, and I didn't necessarily know if it was going to um, add value uh, to this presentation or if I'd bias my results. I didn't have video or anything to uh, really fact check it off of, so, uh, and we only had the skater in question for the most part. So um, it's definitely a little easier said than done to create a uh, transient state like that. So uh, I decided to use a, that a simpler approach would be um, solid enough. 
Great, we probably have time for one more question. Uh, Eric, did you have any? Sure. Um, I guess I'm looking at this plot that's in front of me where almost all of the credit or blame is being given to the shooter and wondering how you sort of break apart how much of the credit would go to the shooter and to the passer. Um, yeah, I feel like uh, it's certainly um, not who it's not the uh, most um, it's not the most helpful in this uh, way it was to show the overall net uh, contribution but I feel like um, maybe uh, scaling and looking at the individual components a little more would be pretty helpful um, and also I think having more teams would be uh, pretty useful because I do think there are guys that legitimately are poor passers. They're uh, not contributing um, uh, in passing, but uh, maybe the, but it does appear that passing, you are trying to pass the puck into dangerous zones, committing turnovers all the time. So um, even though it is negative, it could be good. So I, I feel like I definitely can improve the scale uh, and uh, interpretation of the non-shooting components a little more and to get uh, maybe more of a range of values. So uh, that's how I'd approach that one with some more time. Great. Any final questions from our judges this evening? All right. Well, Greg, Thank you so much, uh, tremendous work. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, we will transition on to our second presentation of the night. I'll invite our second group if they'd like to go ahead and prepare sharing of their slides. I would like to introduce Brendan Kumagai, Mikhail Nahabedian, Thibaut Chatel, and Tyrell Stokes, who will be presenting on Bayesian space, time models for expected possession added value. Gentlemen, I'll turn it over to you. All right, great. Thanks, Allison. Um, if I can get a screen share, I'll pull up my slides and then we'll get going. Oh, there we go. So just to check, can you guys see my cursor and my slides? We can. Perfect. All right, awesome. So um, our presentations on Bayesian space time models for expected possession added value. And before we get into things, we just wanted to take a quick second to thank Megan Chaika, Michael Shuckers, Allison Lucan, Shirley Mills, and everyone else involved uh, in this competition and conference. Um, it's been amazing so far, and we're uh, looking forward to keeping things rolling. And just to introduce our team quickly, um, so it's Tyrell Stokes, Thibaut Chatel, and uh, Mikhail Nahabedian, and myself, and we're from Toronto and Montreal. And to start off, we want to get to our goal and our scope before we talk about anything else. Um, so our goal with this project is to estimate how much value an individual event contributes to the overall offensive potential of a sequence of events. And uh, due to the time frame of this project and the complexity of our model, we decided to focus in on even strength sequences that start with an entry and end with either an exit or a whistle, whichever comes first. And in addition to that, we're only concerned with assigning value with respect to the offensive team. Um, so to provide a visual of what our end goal will look like, uh, you can just take a look at that visual on the right here. And basically for every event in this entry to exit sequence, uh, we create this metric called the possession added value or the PAV, uh, which can be thought of as the increase or decrease in offensive value from this event uh, or uh, from taking this action pretty much. And our work was largely inspired by three papers here. Um, so our research question was built off of our very own Thibaut Chatel's previous work in offensive sequences in hockey. And we wanted to kind of add more statistical rigor to that um, by bringing in uh, the expected possession value model built in basketball by Dan Cervone and a few others. And in addition to that, our possession added value metric was largely inspired by um, the uh, Karun Singh's expected threat model in soccer. Okay, so um, how would we um, assign value to an action? 
Um, now, ideally, if we could do absolutely anything we wanted in the world, what we would do is if we were um, thinking about what's the value of, of taking a shot at this blue circle here, uh, we would build a time machine. And we would build a time machine and then we would go back, we would get back to the exact moment in time and we would replay that sequence and we would replay that sequence over and over and over again. And every time we replay that sequence, you know, things are gonna happen a little differently. Maybe the shot goes right in the net. Um, maybe the goalie covers it and we get a whistle. Maybe we get a rebound and maybe the rebound is in different spots. Um, the really goal here is, and, and, and also think about all the, the cases where we choose not to shoot, where we could uh, you know, make a pass or we could end up holding onto the puck too long and losing it. The goal here is we wanna build a time machine. And you can see all these little paths, these sequences um, in gray here. And um, all of our modeling is gonna be inspired. How can we build this time machine to get these paths? How can we value those paths, those likely sequences that are going to happen? And then how can we deal with the uncertainty in those paths and the uncertainty in their value? And our first step here is to ask ourselves, um, how does an offensive sequence develop? And in order to answer this question, we use something called the Markov decision process, which you can simply just think of as a flow chart. Um, so basically we're flowing through this diagram here to build reasonably realistic sequences. Like for example, we start with a zone entry, um, then we might make a pass, then from the pass we shoot, and then that shot might deflect out of play and we get a whistle. And that's kind of the skeleton of how our model is built. And um, on top of that, the next step here would be to determine which event comes next. So for example, if we're at a turnover, um, we have two different options given our model here. So we can either recover the puck or the other team's gonna exit um, and take the puck out and the play will end. So we wanna determine what's the probability that the other team exits and what's the probability that we recover the puck. How do we figure this out? So here in the left, we have sort of a visual representation of the data. The top map is um, given that there was a turnover, where exits um, seem to happen from, and the bottom map is uh, where the recoveries happen. Um, so we're gonna put this into uh, something called INLA. We're gonna build a model in INLA. Um, and there's a couple important steps. The first one you can see with these little triangles is for computational reasons, we need to chop the ice up in some way. Um, and so we chop them up into little uh, triangles. This is kind of similar to um, a lot of you are familiar with Micah's work at HockeyViz where he uh, cuts the ice up into little hexagons. The special thing about these triangles is we actually treat things within the triangles as slightly different. And so we get this output of a map, which you can kind of see is still actually smooth and looks a lot like the data going in. There's two other sort of important parts of an inla map uh, or an inla model. We have to decide how much um, information to share across space. We use something called a matern covariance function. Um, and we have to set some priors. And we use something called penalized complexity priors. Um, the idea here is just to kind of smooth our maps a little bit and try to prevent overfitting. So once we have these output maps, um, the kind of the second set of maps here, we need to combine them in some way to get probabilities. Um, we use something called a Poisson trick, which essentially just allows us to add those two maps together and get a probability. And you can kind of see in this final map here, the areas where they're really bright, that's where it's really likely to have a recovery, um, mostly in the corners, the areas where it's darker, there's more likely to be an exit, mostly near the blue line. So there's also an extra little hitch. Um, we allow the maps to evolve slightly over time. And time here is taken from time of entering the zone. And the idea is that as soon as we enter the zone, zero to say two seconds right after, we're likely on a rush chance or something that resembles it. And by the time the play is developed for a long time, we expect the defense to be really set up. So the fact that the defensive structure changes is going to change our options. And then that's also should be changing what is likely to happen. So we allow all of our models to evolve over time to reflect this change in defensive structure. Um, and that's just one example um, of the kind of models we have to build. If we want to build a time machine, um, we need to be able to take any action and figure out what the next action is, given we're in a space, uh, a location. So these are a bunch of different models that we made in much the same way we just described. Um, but we also need some other things to stick it all together. If we want to actually have a time machine that figures out where we're going to go and all those sequences, we need models that predict where are we in space. We need models that figure out, for example, where past targets are going to be. We need models that predict covariates that are going to be important to us, like whether or not there's traffic in front of the net. All of these models, again, are spatial models and have a similar sort of idea to what we just showed you. 
Um, and finally, we said our other goal is not just to make a time machine, but we want to know how valuable those different uh, probable sequences are. So we have two different models that are going to value um, those things. And they're essentially just spatial uh, expected goal models. And once we have all these models built out, we can start jumping in our time machine and simulating plays. Um, so as a simple example here, given we're at this green point on the left, um, one possible sequence that we can do is pass it to the right side, take a shot, and we have a whistle. Um, so once we have these simulations, we can just start grabbing the cumulative expected goals for each simulation and throwing it into this histogram here on the right, which kind of gives us a distribution of how valuable this point of the sequence is. So we get the value of the sequence at a moment in time. And we call this the expected possession value or XPV. And once we know how valuable time is at a moment, we can move on to our big question, which is how much value does an event add to a sequence? And in order to do this, um, we're going to go back to that original example Tyrell had to kind of explain how we go through the process of this, um, where we have a shot from the high slot here. So given we take a shot from there, we need three things. So we need the XPV at the moment prior to the shot. We need the expected goals from the shot. And we need the XPV at the next observed location after the shot. And once we have these three things, we can plug them into our formula here, which is basically saying um, we're adding our probability of scoring, the value after taking the shot given we didn't score, and we're subtracting the value that we were at prior to shooting. So these first two components here are really like uh, the value we're adding because of the shot. And the third one is the value that we had before the shot that we no longer have. And out of this, we can, um, using our simulations, get this distribution here. So that kind of not only gives us like a point estimate of how valuable our uh, event is, but it also gives us like a whole distribution of how valuable we expect it to be. And this is what we call our possession added value or PAV. And also one other little detail, if we're not taking a shot, if we're doing a pass or recovering the puck, um, then we're going to evaluate this a little bit differently. We're just going to simplify it by ignoring the expected goals components and just take the expected possession value at the moment, um, or so the expected possession value at the next observed location after the event, minus the expected possession value at the moment prior to the event. And that's kind of how we build our path metric here. And now we're gonna hand it over to Thibaut to talk about some general findings from a model. So moving on to the general findings is going to sound pretty obvious at first, but that's maybe a good thing because it's actually showing that we're not completely off track with this idea. So the first thing I like, jump out from the model is that time and space play a huge role in how much value you can create. So namely, the first few seconds following a zone entries are the most dangerous and the center of the ice is the most dangerous area. So if you combine both, you're in a very good position to create something. If you have none of them, you don't have any much potential left. So namely, you can imagine after a few seconds, um, the defense is set, uh, the slot is closed, and most of the time you can only cycle the puck, get a point shot, and hope for the best. So in terms of events that are adding value or decreasing value, um, zone entries, the immense majority of players are getting a positive path from zone entries, and that includes dump ins. And the model actually sees that you're moving from not being in the offensive zone to being an offensive zone. So even if it's a dump, at least you have the possibility to maybe start something and get, maybe get a shot. Um, so you get a positive path from shots and you get a positive path from puck recoveries because at least you're creating something. On the other hand, you get a negative path from turnovers, which is obvious as well. And a quick word about, word about passes. The model saw that the huge majority of passes are happening in a time in space frame where there is no much value to create. And once again, uh, once the defense is set up and you're just cycling the puck, all those little passes that are happening along the board or behind the net, they're not moving the needle at all. So you're very close to zero path. And this is where having player movement data will help a lot, like it did in the NBA, for instance, um, into understanding the decision-making process into seeing how much the defensive structure is influencing that decision-making process. Uh, it will help to see if the passer is actually trying to create something or if he's just escaping pressure uh, from the defense. So another very cool thing that we uh, saw from the model is that visually we saw 
how much the valuable area of the ice is shrinking over time. So going back to the importance of time into creating value. And you can see on those heat maps, so the lighter color of the heat map is the most valuable areas. And you can see that after just a few seconds, not only is it shrinking, but that also means that areas that were valuable before are not valuable anymore. So that really shows you how much um, your expected goal, your expected value is decreasing as you're transitioning from rush play to the offensive zone play. And that's, that's the thing that has been around hockey the past few years in the way that teams have been playing. So um, in terms of using PAP, which was the main focus of our project, obviously, uh, you really have to see it as an overview matrix that's giving you a global assessment of how much a player is contributing for his team or not, it could be negative. So you have the total path and you can adjust it by uh, position, age. We would very much like to adjust it between leagues in terms of scouting perspective, because the um, contribution, your, expect your expectation for how much a player is contributing as maybe a 17 years old in the OHL should be comparable to how much a 17 years old in Finnish Liga is doing, for instance. So you get a total path and you can compare to team average, league average, the usual. And the realm of infinite possibilities really opens when you get into looking at each of the components of path. So you can see the performance on each of those components. So we have some entries, passes, shot, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see the relationship between two components or more. You can add time and space into that and you really have an infinity of, of possibilities. Another very useful thing that we saw out of this project is that behind the row numbers, you can easily create those visual help for the analysis, like those heat maps we're showing right now, that shows where on the ice a player is creating value or not. Again, it, it can be negative. So that's what's new for us because the hard data providers out there that are providing heat maps of where a player is active on the ice based on how many events is participating in, but there is a huge difference between being active and actually creating something. So this is where PAP comes in and adds another layer to the story. And I'm gonna give the microphone to Mick, who is actually putting himself into the position of a scout using both PAV and the traditional uh, video analysis in a, a case study. Thanks, Thibault. So from a scouting standpoint, breaking down PAV per event type can be a good starting point to identify the strengths and the weaknesses of prospects in the ozone. And then if we combine that with other metrics and more traditional scouting, methods that will help us enhance scouting reports. Here we have the player card of Connor Lockhart, a player who is eligible for the 2021 NHL draft. And when we look at this player card, we actually notice that Connor Lockhart adds value to his team's offensive sequences in various ways. Specifically looking at zone entries, Connor Lockhart ranks around the 62nd percentile among all OHL forwards in terms of path. That's good for, for a 16 year old. And when we look at the zone entry distribution, we actually notice that he tends to enter the zone from the right side rather than through the middle of the ice more often than not. So to go from being good on zone entries to being a great player in this category, what he could do is use more lane changes through the neutral zone when carrying the puck to initiate entries through the middle of the ice and generate more chances off the rush. In terms of recoveries and turnovers, Lockhart ranks around the 60th and 49th percentiles respectively in these categories. For recoveries, continuing to focus on smartly recovering the puck along the boards on both sides of the ozone will be the key to keeping a strong track record in this category. In terms of turnovers, the first touch will be key for him to improve in this category. So better control of the puck on the first touch will help him limit and even avoid turnovers. In terms of passes, Connor Lockhart ranks around the 51st percentile among all OHL forwards in terms of path. And when looking at the pass clustering plot, we actually noticed that the sum of low value passes, so the low cycle passes, the low to high passes, 
is superior to the sum of these valuable plays that go into the inner slot or that go into the dangerous areas of the ice. And so for him to improve in this category or this aspect of the game, what Connor Lockhart could work on is passing the puck quicker to his teammates to limit his opponent's reaction time and give him more opportunities to make these high value plays as passing lane open up with sticks that are moving around. Finally, overall, if we look at the global picture, Connor Lockhart ranks around the 50th percentile among all OHL forwards in terms of path. And as we just saw, he has some strengths in the ozone, which could be signs of interesting offensive upside. He obviously has some things to work on in his game. And that's why we believe that he could be an interesting project for a team that's drafting in rounds four to seven of the upcoming NHL draft. So where do we go next? What can we do next with our project? In terms of the model and methodology, we could look at incorporating all three zones, quantifying defensive contributions and extending our model as tracking data becomes available. And in terms of the hockey analysis part, we could look at clustering players by their path components, analyzing spatial temporal changes in path over a season to look at player consistency and incorporating uncertainty into the analysis of players and sequences. Thank you very much for taking time to listen to our presentation. We now open the floor to questions. Thank you, gentlemen, that was awesome. I'll invite our judges to join via video and ask any questions that might be of mind. Uh, I'll go first. Once again, just a really excellent and clear presentation, so thank you. Um, while this is still fresh on my mind, you talked about limitations. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, you did or have plans to account for talent on the ice. Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, so it's the kind of thing that um, could be done. So in this data, it would have been quite a challenge to reconstruct even just who is on the ice, because we really only get these glimpses of, you know, if somebody has done an event recently, maybe we could infer who is on the ice. Um, but for a lot of the players, in fact, if they don't touch the puck, we wouldn't even know who's, who is there. Um, but can you do it? Um, yes. It's definitely not easy. So the paper that we're kind of cribbing from the most um, by Dan Servone and uh, Luke Bourne, and I guess uh, and two others, um, they basically ended up making um, you know maps for each players. Um, the, there is a computational uh, you know challenge there, and what they did have to do is sort of uh, I think they had to do some sort of a player similarity type thing to be able to share information efficiently across players. Um, but it does seem to be possible, and they did that with much more uh, data than we did. So it's not, it's certainly not impossible, but, you know, those guys are the best. So it would not be easy. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. So, Tyrod, if I can add, sure. I, I, actually, at the beginning, we were hoping to add another layers into seeing who the puck is coming from and who the puck is going to in terms of players. And to see the impact of you know the strengths of your uh, of your teammates is impacting the value of the play, mm -hmm. so that that was something on our mind for sure. That's something we would like to do. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. This is really interesting. Um, I had a question about you mentioned that there was. Uh, different models for the different time intervals, uh, you know, zero to two seconds into the zone yeah. and, and so forth. Um, did that cause any further like sample size issues or was that like, uh, I mean, were you, was that, I think you said you were smoothing over space and time. Is this where the smoothing yeah. over time came in? Yeah. So um, I guess there's in general, um, what we were trying to do is we want to share information across space and time. Um, the way we did that is we, were, we shared um, information over space using this sort of matern structure, and we share information on time by on top of that matern, we allow the maps to evolve with an AR1 process. Um, and a lot of, in a lot of the cases, the estimated um, correlation in the maps is quite high. So you end up sharing quite a bit of information, especially in relatively nearby states. Um, something that is super cool about INLA, um, and we were only able to do it fully on some of the models, 
Um, but Inla actually allows you to fit um, approximations to continuous AR1 processes. Um, and that's obviously normally would be extremely challenging, but the way they do it is they allow you to define knots. And in similar to the way that they allowed us to define triangles and we interpolate within the triangles, you define knots in time and you're able to interpolate between um, you know, moments in time. So you're actually able to treat something that is 2.3 seconds and 2.7 seconds as different. And in our experience, not only does this, is this better conceptually, because you share more information, those models fit faster and better than the equivalent models where you bin things by time. Um, but so we were using this AR1 process that sort of allows us to share information across time. And in some cases, this continuous as a, a, a approximation to a continuous AR1 process on the maps themselves. And uh, just to jump in there, um, if we look at our expected goals model, um, so this is kind of what Tyrell is talking about here. So rather than having like the zero to two, two to five and so on bins, uh, we just kind of have knots at like zero seconds to uh, five, 10, and then over 10, right? So that's kind of the difference there. Um, and in this case, we get five maps and we're kind of having a knot in between each one rather than like bins. But, but yeah, so for example, if we notice something at one seconds, the model that we're actually using is in between those first two maps. It's somewhere in between. Um, and so that's really huge for the sample size issues because you're right, in some of the events, we're not going to get a lot of sample sizes, but in, in our case, there's typically enough correlation that we can still share a lot of information. Um. Okay, awesome, thanks. Uh, hi guys, I just, I, first I just wanted to say, uh, you know, this was amazing. Uh, the amount of effort that went into, and effort and thought that went into the process here, I love. Um, my question for you is related to my, my previous research on EPV and basketball, which is that uh, you have a high percentage of these, what I call setup plays, which are designed to space the defense, right? And they get these like little tiny negative values over and over and over and over again on certain players. And those players also may have these like one great plays where they make a pass to a cutting player. And I'm sure we're gonna see the same thing in hockey, right? When we, when we produce this, um, did you guys think about that? And did you notice it creeping into your player values at all? Yeah, um, so there's a lot to say. I feel like several of us will have different points on this. Um, so um, I guess the first, the first thing is like, Definitely this is set up from kind of the predictive perspective um, and kind of from that perspective, I guess it's, it's less concerning, but then if you wanna kind of go back and especially interpret um, different components of it, um, now you're kind of entering more you know, causal land where you have to be a little bit careful. And we definitely notice this with passes and we suspect that there's a large selection bias problem. And Thibaut kind of touched on this um, a little bit in his presentation where kind of like you are saying, um, we suspect that a lot of times uh, when somebody is making a pass, because we don't know exactly where the defense is, it's likely that they felt that was the best option because they were getting closed off. And where is the most, where is it best to pass to? Brendan, you can maybe pull up our maps about pass completion. Yep. Or on not this one, right? The pass completion. Yeah, completion. So we did do some modeling about where is it likely to complete a pass. And if you look at the right, um, this is where your target is. And you'll notice that really the easiest passes to make are around the outside. And from our other stuff, that's where the lowest value is. And they're likely to happen later in the play, which we also showed as lower value. So you do get that sort of a, a thing. Um, now, what, what can you do to deal with that? Well, it's a little bit complicated. Like one, you're probably gonna have to set your research question up exactly to deal with that. Actually, Ozma has some really good uh, work on zone entries that kind of takes a a matching, or you could do like a weighting approach to kind of deal with that sort of uh, a problem, but probably also you're going to need, uh, you know, better data where you can actually kind of see um, that kind of uh, the selection process in action. Um, probably some other people might have something to say about that, maybe too, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you say pretty much everything. I mean, one of the question we had also is that in terms of passing, so all those little passes that we you just mentioned, there is basically no short-term gain in terms of PAV. And I mean, it's, it's very close to zero. It's even some, most of the time a little bit negative because you, uh, each additional passes increase the risk of creating a turnover. But 
it will be very interesting and pretty hard to link it to a long-term goal of setting up setting up plays that will happen like five to ten second, seconds later. Um, but yeah, we we thought about it. That's certainly something, and we will need you know better data and player tracking movement that will help to see where the guys are on the ice um, and see maybe try to figure out what the passer has in mind when he's passing like back to the point because he know the right winger is getting free back door. So the play is going to develop that way. So, but we will need better data. That's the, that's the best answer we can give, but we thought about it. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank, thanks guys. Um, uh, yeah, I guess the only other thing I had related to that was I do worry about how this would evaluate guys who are asked to uh, play against the boards and they're constantly in battles over there. And then they're, they're making like the one play that they can make, uh, which is probably, which is a, a positive thing they did for their team. They just recovered the puck and played it out, but it may not look great. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Kind of going that, I guess this kind of feels a little bit similar to Eric's question in the last uh, kind of presentation. And I think it's a hard problem. Like I, I've played around a little bit. Like if you have, if you have observations of everybody on the ice, um, now um, kind of this is kind of the inverse of um, of the question about how do you distribute value of say the shot taker? Because in reality, we know that it's not just a shot taker that's that's creating a good shot. Um, similarly, if somebody makes a bad plat pass, it's not just you know it's not just them creating that. It's it's about everyone, and really we should be dividing credit in some way. Uh, among those play, among all the players on the ice or on that team, how do you do that? Um, spatially, it's quite hard and it's quite challenging. I've I've tried you know small little Bayesian models where you just chop the ice into really big chunks and you try to uh, have people have different coefficients for different parts of the ice and, and and any kind of event that happens, you're sharing in some way. The person making it gets the most credit, but everyone else gets a little bit. And those models are really hard to make. Um, and there's probably a good way to do it and probably more data will help, but I don't think it's, it's not easy. Thanks. So building on that a little bit, um, it seems like part of why you're ending up with a little bit of a, a small negative for every pass is you're basically comparing that play to all the other plays where somebody had the puck in a similar spot. And the handful of times they were able to shoot generated a whole lot of opportunity and so then everything else is left a little bit negative. Um, effectively, the, the kind of implicit assumption there is that the players have no capacity to discern when they should shoot and when they shouldn't. I wonder what happens if you make the exact opposite assumption, that they are perfect at making that distinction, and so you can set the shot plays aside and just model the passes on the assumption that no shot was possible from there if maybe then you get a better way to, I wonder where that goes in terms of valuing the passes that they make. Yeah, yeah, that's not bad. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a fully formed thought on that, but something that we were thinking about a lot is, um, so these kind of markup decision process models, at least in my kind of other research world of causal inference, um, really developed um, side by side with um, these kind of models for something called dynamic treatment um, regimes. And the goal there is in medicine, you have sort of a sequence of uh, medicines or doses that you want to give, and you want to find kind of the optimal sequence. And so a way to kind of use this kind of model and maybe get a little bit closer to what you're talking about is to try to ask ourselves, um, instead of um, summing up the values that they made, we compare them to the optimal and we try to see how close they are to uh, sort of an optimal choice given their spot, instead of comparing them, like you said, to all of the people that were um, in a spot. And likely what we would see is a lot of the passes, they probably were pretty close to optimal. Maybe the best you can do is basically just stick around even. Um, so I think that would be one way to sort of use this framework um, along that uh, along that way. And maybe, maybe like you said, maybe throwing up the shots um, at least for now, maybe that does uh, probably do it. I don't know for sure. Thanks. All right, we have time for maybe one more. Any other questions from the judges? All right, we did have one question. Um, this is from a participant. Um, so if any of you could offer comment on measuring the performance of your model, how it was tested, how it was evaluated. I think Nick will probably also have a few things to say about this, but um, what, what I will say, at least from, I think, Brendan and our, our perspective when we're building the model, um, 
a lot of, um, we haven't done a ton of, um, you know, proper checking of the entire model, except for other than kind of evaluating are the sequences we're getting kind of reasonable and so on. But we did spend a lot of time on each individual model and trying to figure out, um, you know, if the individual models are good. Um, so how do you do that? Um, so one, we we're kind of just checking the maps visually to see like, do these maps sort of make sense? We we're thinking about that a lot. Um, and then two, um, how do you compare models, um, you know, for the same thing? So for example, let's say we're trying to make a model that figures out where the location is. Um, these models are quite um, complicated. And so you can't use a lot of the traditional uh, model selection um, kind of metrics that you would want. But one you, that is available is something called a WAIC. The WAIC has some really nice theoretical properties that um, it actually, as your sample size gets really large, it's, it's very similar. It's, it's essentially equivalent to a, a leave one out uh, cross validation type metric. Um, and so uh, we were using that to kind of compare um, competing models on the different, on the different parts. Um, whereas because of the scale of the model, doing an actual cross validation would have been kind of um, off the table. But uh, one thing that definitely is still on the table is now that we kind of have this big machine uh, running, kind of actually checking um, you know, our simulating se sequences against the actual sequences or some kind of smaller uh, leave one out procedure uh, would be really useful. Um, um, but I think also on the sort of scouting side, Mick was sort of, Mick maybe can speak to um, uh, how we were um, sort of integrating you know, the results that we got with sort of traditional scouting as well. Yeah, so um, Brennan, if you could please go to the path distribution. Uh, this one? Yeah, exactly. So from a scouting perspective, we looked at the path distributions for both forwards and defensemen, just to make sure that, that they were pretty even and that, that they were making sense in, in that we had some very good players, we had some not so very good players, and then we had play, like the majority of players that were within um, path average. And basically what we figured out when we were, we we mapped out these distributions is that we were able to see um, a good a good mix of what we were we were like, like what we were expecting to see. So we had very good players, and then we had a few players that weren't so good, and then we had most of our players in the middle. And from a scouting standpoint, while the individual data points for all players except those of the others authors weren't that great just because we had the small sample size, we were able to, to basically estimate that our, our predictions from a scouting standpoint and from a player evaluation standpoint were pretty good. And I would kind of add to that as well. Um, so also um, when Tebow was talking about the team level stuff, he was looking at kind of like uh, the average, kind of like how, how much PAV you generate per play. Um, and that's kind of good to see like who's generating the most per play, but it's kind of tough to really evaluate it versus kind of what the general opinion is. Um, but if we look at kind of like the total overall path over the whole 40 games that we had um, for all of the otters forwards, you can kind of see like Yetman and Golad who are generally most people would say they're the top two forwards on the team for sure. Um, they're pretty much like Yetman especially is kind of far and away the best forward. So it kind of lines up at least like to kind of the general consensus and the point totals. We, we also did look at some of the non-otters players and like kind of on a per game uh, level, mm -hmm. a lot of the players that were doing really well um, of the kind of top 10, a lot of them I've already seen games in the AHL or the, uh, or the NHL or, um, and, or were kind of top uh, junior prospects. So that did sort of line up with uh, what we were sort of expecting. Yeah, I think Rossi was number one for us. Yeah, Kaliev as well. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, thank you, gentlemen, um, for this outstanding presentation. We appreciate all four of you and the work that you put in. Uh, we will move on now to our next finalist. Uh, I will introduce um, Ian. Ian, if you'd like to go ahead and if we can make sure Ian has screen sharing um, abilities um, and he can get his presentation ready. Ian Ashtalosh is going to present on Teamwork Makes the Dream Work. Ian, I will turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, just checking we can we can see everything and hear me. We can. Excellent. Um, so let's get started. So um, yeah, my name is Ian Astolosh. Um, teamwork makes the dream work. So 
as you can might be able to tell from my accent, um, I'm Australian. I'm from Sydney. Um, so my introduction to hockey came really a few weeks ago, and it wasn't um, through going to games or watching them on TV. Um, it's through playing NHL Live 2006 on the Xbox um, and watching the Mighty Ducks films, right? Which, you know, maybe not the most factual um, and necessarily accurate introduction, but I guess if there's one thing that, that we do learn from this, um, it's that you need to be able to play as a team to win. Normally it happens about, you know, between the second and third period, there's a big rousing pep talk um, and they sort of figure everything out. But that leads to the bigger point that passing is fundamental to winning hockey games, you know, and it's not only just passing on its own, it's passing with a purpose. You can have two defensemen sort of flicking it between each other in your own third. And that's great because you've, you've, you've completed a couple of passes, your, your accuracy goes up, you feel great, but you haven't actually done anything to increase your chances of scoring a goal and winning the game. And essentially for me, for someone who, like I said, was new to hockey, I wanted to do something a bit sort of exploratory and try and figure out, well, what are the passes that lead to goals? What are the types of sequences and patterns that teams employ that actually does drive goal scoring? And this has benefits both as the observer trying to understand the game, but also tactically as a coach trying to game plan. Because offensively, if you know sort of the channels and patterns um, that lead to goals, obviously now you can practice that. You can design attacks sort of around that. While defensively, you can set up specific structures to counteract that when your opponents attack. So really having a solid understanding of where goals come from is vital to, to a team's success. And that's really what I wanted to get at today, essentially building a framework where we can evaluate the types of passes that are most important to creating both scoring opportunities, but also high quality scoring opportunities. Because I can take a shot from my own third and that's great. Um, it'd be a miracle if it went in, right? So we need to be able to both have generate chances, but generate high quality chances. And the way that I've gone about this um, is in three steps. So firstly, defining a way of categorizing pass types so we can compare and contrast types of passes, then developing a metric to evaluate how important these passes are in the build up to goals. And for that, we'll be borrowing uh, from soccer a little bit. And finally, assessing the value of each of these clusters using this metric. So firstly, the data. Um, I've used the women's data, very kindly provided by Stathletes. Um, it's the play-by-play -play of the women's Olympic, uh, collegiate, and NWHL games. And for this analysis, I've only considered even strength situations, so five on five. Um, this leaves us with about 15,000 pass attempts, about 2,500 shot attempts. Um, as we can see, this picture on the right, every pass in the data set, uh, you know, it looks, you know, it's kind of nice. You could sell it as an NFT or something if you really wanted to. But it's hard to take this and try and extract insights. So what we want to do is simplify the problem. Instead of looking at 2,500 different types of passes, let's try and simplify that to certain groups. And this is where the pass clustering comes in. We want to be able to group passes based on um, their location and what they're trying to achieve. This has been done a handful of times um, in the past, primarily for the NHL and men's hockey. So Stimson and Weinberger both have excellent posts about this on hockey graphs, sort of going through tendencies and where teams like to attack. Um, but David Yu um, presented at the Columbus Blue Jackets conference last year, um, I think really has the, the best approach to it. Um, and his clustering approach is, is what we've modeled or what I've modeled uh, my approach on today. So I'll run through it quickly. Essentially, the way that we come up with these, these pass types is we take every pass in the data set and we firstly mirror all the passes so that they originate from the same side of the ice. Once we have this and everything sort of starting on the same side, we can now apply the clustering algorithm, which um, in this case is going to be k-means, and I'll get into the, the number of cluster selection in a second. And then once we have um, our clusters all on one side, we return the passes that we mirrored back to the original side of the ice. So what this does is it creates um, it creates a cluster that has both a left-hand side and a right-hand side. So we have passes originating from both sides with the same sort of general shape, but separate sides of the ice. What you did in his analysis was when he unmirrored those passes, he actually created a separate cluster on the other side, um, which is something that I chose, chose not to do. 
for the same reason, I'm assuming that um, attacking sort of down the left-hand side, attacking down the right-hand side are roughly equivalent. Um, really what I base that off is, you know, when you watch the NFL and they talk about um, sort of route classification, you hear a lot about hook routes and, and go routes, but it's it, they don't really distinguish between a left go route and a right go route or a, a left hook route and a, a right hook route. Um, so even though there might be, you know, sort of a subtle difference, I think what we really want to get at is the intention of the pass and sort of the shape and how it um, goes from the, the passer to the goal. Um, yeah, and really just assuming that the left and the right are not too dissimilar. One thing that I've also done is included incomplete passes in this clustering analysis, which is a point raised by Weinberg on his post that, um, and we've heard in other presentations, when a pass is incomplete, we don't really know the true intention of that pass because it was intercepted before it got to a target or it missed its target and it ended up 10 meters up the ice down the road. Um, I've decided to keep those passes in as well um, because generally I feel like it's not missing by too much. These are professionals that we're talking about. Um, and also just it helps the sample size. So with those 15,000 passes, we want to keep as many passes in the data as possible. Um, and I feel like keeping them in is sort of beneficial. So with this method, we can now apply this to women's hockey and we end up with our 25 passing clusters. As I said, um, you ended up using 100 clusters. I've scaled it back to 25, generally because we wanna preserve, as I said, sample size. We want each cluster to have a decent amount of passes in it so that we're able to sort of make meaningful comparisons between them. So within each cluster um, on, these, on this picture, you can sort of see a gray shadow, which represents all of the passes within that cluster. And then the colored arrow um, sort of represents the average, the average pass in that cluster. Um, it's the mean of all the starting points to the mean of all the finishing points on each side. And we can see this, this does pretty well at representing um, the sort of general trends that we see in hockey all the time. So cluster, uh, cluster nine is sort of a stretch pass, one of those quick outlet passes from the defense. Cluster 21, when you're stuck in the corner of the offensive zone um, and kicking it back to the blue line. So these are the archetypes that we see all the time and it's sort of the 25 average passes that represent um, what we see in women's hockey. I should also say in all of these pictures, uh, the attacking team is, is moving towards the right. So yeah, context. If we zoom in on some of these clusters, so cluster three is our smallest in terms of membership starting from your own goal. Compared to cluster 20, we can see very large. So it's about um, 200 passes in cluster three, about a thousand in cluster 20. Um, and we do see there is quite a bit of variance within the cluster. Um, this is sort of a consequence of using a smaller clusters assess to, to divide every possible pass. Um, but as long as we're aware of this, we're still able to move forward with the analysis. So now that we have these clusters and these pass types, what we wanna do is assign a value to them. So how important was this pass to ultimately the, the outcome of the possession in sort of the chain a chain of passes, what did this pass do to help the, the final shot. The way we're doing this um, is by borrowing from soccer and StatsBomb's XG chain and XG build up metrics that they use. So essentially what they do is look at a shot and look at all of the passes that contributed to that shot. And what they do is look at how often individual players are involved in the build up. Because if a player is, um, if he's got his fingerprints all over a certain move, then we're saying that's probably a pretty, pretty influential player. What we want to do is instead of looking at individual players, look at the pass types itself. So how common are certain pass types used in the buildup to creating scoring attempts? And the way that we do this um, is now a four-step process. So firstly, we need to separate the match into a series of possessions. Um, so we define a possession as starting, finally enough, when a, when a team gains possession of the puck, be it through a face-off, um, a takeaway, or, or a puck recovery. We say a possession ends when they either lose the puck um, through a giveaway or a penalty, an incomplete pass, or crucially, when they take a shot or score a goal. Because in these cases, I'm saying they're deliberately ceding control of the puck um, and they don't expect it to get it back. Um, when you take a shot, generally you're expecting to score. And I know sometimes you might just take a shot hoping to get a rebound and create something else. Um, but for the most part, we're just saying when a team takes a shot, then they're hoping to score. They're not expecting to get it back. So now instead of just a series of events, in the play-by-play -play data, we now have a series of categories where each team had possession of the puck. 
What we now want to do is assign a value to each of those possessions. And the way we do that is by using expected goals. So by definition, each possession can only have one shot on it because a shot signals the end of the possession. So the value that we assign to the possession is if a shot was taken, the expected goals of that shot. If a shot was not taken, the possession unfortunately gets a value of zero because this possession, it, it didn't really add anything in terms of creating a chance to score a goal to, to go and win the game. Um, for expected goals, the model that I used was just a logistic regression, um, a GLM classifier in R. So we can see in the bottom right, the heat map sort of showing how these expected goals um, vary based on where you take the shot from in the offensive zone. Um, and yeah, the features were mostly locational and also a time aspect between the shot being taken and the previous event. Now we've all seen expected goals before, but the real question is, how do we take expected goals and distribute that amongst the passes? And the way that we do that is through this formula. So essentially the individual pass value is a proportion of the expected goals for that possession based on how close that the possession was, how close the pass was to the eventual shot. So the possession times 13 minus n over n in this formula, n is the number of passes between the current pass and the final shot. So if this pass directly leads to a shot, it gets the full value of the possession. It gets the expected goals of that shot. If a pass happens five passes before the shot, it still gets a certain proportion of that final shot, but not, it's not quite as important. We're saying the passes that came after it probably did more to contribute to the eventual shot that was taken. So seeing this in practice, if we had a possession which had five passes in it, starting at their own goal, sort of swinging it up the right, back arounds, um, squaring it up and taking a shot for expected goals of 0 0.0195, the way that the value would be distributed is something like this. So the shot that led, to, uh, the pass that led to the shot gains the full value of the possession. But as we move back in time, each of those passes, the value somewhat diminishes. Then finally, to get the value of each cluster, um, we simply just average the value of the passes within the cluster, essentially. And this is the method that we're going to use to evaluate how important each pass type is um, to the quality of shots. I think the cool thing about this and sort of how it differs to expected threat is that you don't need a separate model for this. So it's built entirely off of expected goals, um, which essentially simplifies. There's been a lot more research into expected goals, I think, deserve a certain level of trust in the community with that. And also this weighting factor that I've talked about is configurable. So at the moment, it's, it's linear and we can say um, the difference between the first pass in the possession and the second pass in the possession is roughly equal. But if you wanted to use some sort of an inverse square and really weight highly the passes immediately before a shot, you can do that as well. So now that we have our pass clusters and our way of evaluating these passes, we can look at the actual value that they add. And so this is just a scatter plot showing the size of the clusters versus the value they add. And somewhat unsurprisingly, the most valuable passes in terms of creating chances are the ones that happen in the offensive zone. So cluster 24, the picture next to it, um, is a pass sort of just in, to in front of the slot, which quite often leads to shots. Same with 23, it's a pass either to the goal or just behind the goal, um, which again is going to create a high quality shot. And the way we can use something like this is sort of looking for undervalued passes. So something like cluster 25 is a pass from when you're behind the goal and sort of kick it out. Um, maybe when you're in that spot, you don't want to just kick it back to the blue line. You can sort of go for these short passes as they do seem to provide quite a lot of value in terms of creating chances. We can also look at the relationship between the accuracy of a pass um, and its value. And this somewhat replicates something that you found as well, which is that higher value passes are completed at a, at a lower rate, which makes intuitive sense. Um, the defenses know what is dangerous and obviously they're not going to allow passes right into right in front of the goal. While they will allow you to just pass back to each other on halfway, that's completely fine. We can also look more at um, the value in the buildup. So if we were to remove the passes that lead directly to shots, um, what happens here? And we can see it's, it's sort of the usual suspects but I can also draw your attention to clusters nine and 12, sort of in the middle of the screen. These are your stretch passes. So your quick outlet passes from the back. And these really um, are sort of underutilized and do provide a lot of value. So now that we have our framework of the pass types and how we can evaluate each, we can also use this as a scouting tool and sort of see how teams set up and how teams play. So for each NWHL team, we can compare the value they get from each type of pass 
compared to the league average. And C, sort of the Boston pride, where it's blue, it means they're above average. So they, they get a lot of value from moves that start in their own defensive third and sort of these quick outlet passes. But when they get into the offensive third, you know, it, it's not quite as good. We compare that to the Minnesota Whitecaps, who are absolutely lethal around the goal mouth. They get so much more value than the rest of the league on passes directly into the slot. When you're a defense sort of setting up to play them, now you can um, really plan for that, essentially. So we're not only knowing what teams do, but what they do well. So in conclusion, um, it's a framework for, for, for evaluating passes. When a team knows what, te what passes contribute well, and what they don't, they're able to focus on that, either attacking um, to, 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 go, to go through those channels more or defensively set up to stop them. And really, this is the main way this would be used as a team-wide scouting tool. Um, there's a couple of different places you could take this research um, looking on the power play, looking at specific combinations, so looking at pairs of passes as opposed to individuals, and of course, adding the tracking data to add context, I think, is, is beneficial as well. Um, and yeah, that, that's just about it for me. Um, a big thank you to Stathletes for running the competition um, and for the invitation to speak today. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand back to the panel for questions. Thank you. Judges, we welcome your questions. Thanks, Ian. That was uh, that was really cool. Um, I had a question about that passing um, formula. It seems yep. like the sum of the pass values does not equal the expected goals. Um, I guess I, I guess I just wanted to just ask about that formula generally. Yeah. Um, so there's sort of you're right. So in one way to do it would be. Um, to take the final percentage so that the sum of the passes do add up. Um, and sort of in doing this, I guess you lose some of the interpretability because now you can't really say this pass when done a hundred times leads to this number of expected goals because we're, sort of, we're sort of increasing the value. Um, but I think um, I mean, they're both equivalent essentially. Um, it's just, yeah, you lose that value. So what, what we could do is essentially rescale it. Um, or I think for the moment, the number itself doesn't matter as much as the rank relative to the other past clusters. Um, essentially, what we want to see is a comparison of, of the past types. And um, it still contains the scale. So if, if the value is twice as high as um, another type, you can say it's, it's twice as helpful. Um, but yeah, you're right. We, we can't sort of make these statements like this pass adds three expected goals over, over a thousand passes. Um, but I think, I think it's just a, it's a, it's an equivalent way of doing it. If you did want to distribute um, and have it sum up to the pass, or um, yeah, we're sort of just we're sort of just using larger numbers, which which looks nicer rather than having to deal with four decimal places of zero before we get to anything helpful. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, one other quick question in the I think it was the graph that was accuracy versus value, yeah. whatever. There was like a bump in the middle. Is there? Um, any idea what that might be? Yeah, I think, um, so my, my first inkling is, is sample size in that um, these clusters are small and we, we might have, have just gotten lucky. Um, but otherwise it might, it might yeah, in, in short, I don't know, it would require more investigation. Um, when, when you did this for men's hockey, it was a bit more pronounced. Um, so it, it might be, it's just the trade a trade of women's hockey, um, or potentially it could be an advantage um, in that because there's this bump. Maybe those passes are both really valuable and accurate, and teams should should start to employ those more. Um, but yeah, I haven't haven't looked into it too much. I suspect it's sample size though. All right, thanks. All right, uh, uh, Ian. I just I, I wanted to commend you on your communication. Uh, both from the text in the paper itself and also your use of charts. Uh, I thought your paper was the easiest to follow uh, of all the ones I read. So really appreciate that. Thank um, you. Yeah. Um, going back to the pass function, um, yep. I'm, real, I'm remembering now that one of the things I, I didn't like about it or that I am, I'm questioning about it is what makes a pass valuable is the ability to create time and space. 
And what I'm concerned about is that that time and space is created at the beginning of the possession, like out of the D zone, not at the end. Uh, you know, the passes that come thereafter may all be actually very easy to, to, um, to complete if you've already created the space. Yeah, um, you're right. I think that's something where, where the tracking data could come in helpful. So adding context to, to where the space is, is tough. Um, just sort of just extract when you only have where the passes happens. Um, and I think it's something that was mentioned in one of the previous presentations as well, in that players, um, we, we don't know where they were, and if, if this pass was into space or if this was a really difficult pass that somehow um, was completed. Um, so yeah, I think, I think in general with this, with this passing work, adding that context of where everyone is at the ice all the time um, is, is important. But I guess another thing that we could do is if, if, we, if we do have this sort of assumption that the initial passes of the possession are quite important, we can change how this weighting works to um, give a bump to the, the first pass of the possession that starts everything, um, increase that's value through, through some function. Um, maybe, it, maybe a quadratic so it loops down and, and sort of ticks back up at the end, something like that. Um, you could introduce that and sort of see um, see the results of that. So yeah, you're right. Um, it's something that we could look at in the future. Yeah, yeah very similar to um, my, my comments of Greg's paper. I, I think you can use pace to try to approximate space, that yep. right, time and space that the players may have if, if you know that, that play is transitioning quickly. That might be a proxy for, hey, the defense is more spread out there. Uh, throughout the neutral zone, you know, that kind of a thing. And then and see what, what comes from that later on. I, I think uh, in really in both of these papers, I think that that's kind of my one, my one thing you could, I'd like to see what that would look like. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I get, again, a disadvantage of this is it's, it's sort of just the sequence of passes one to the other. So someone might play a pass to the goaltender who might hold it for 20 seconds while, while teams are subbing. Um, and that you're right, that's not captured at the moment. So some sort of, um, yeah, measuring the distance between the passes would, would be interesting. I agree. So, yeah. Thanks, Ian. No worries. Great. Any other questions? Eric? Yep. So, um, something that's always a little bit of a challenge for this kind of work is you have different populations of players that tend to do different things. And so, you know, you might have lower skilled players making easier passes and that makes the easier passes look less effective because the recipient of the pass is a lower skilled teammate. Um, do you have, I know it's not an easy problem, but do you have any thoughts about how this might be adapted to try to make some corrections for that? Yeah, I think you could subset. Um, so I, I didn't look at things like score effects at all, but you could subset to try and keep close games towards um, you know where the, the game's tied in the in the third period, um, where we can maybe assume that both teams have their strongest lineups on the ice. Um, you could you could try to do something like that, um, but then also sort of like I've said with with the tracking data, you could come up with sort of more. Um, more technical measures of, of what a difficult pass was um, and sort of apply that to sort of know, okay, maybe um, this was a difficult pass and it was completed in sort of these sort of situations. Um, possibly adding, adding that extra context, something like that. Um, but yeah, outside of, outside of that, um, it is tough. And I think one of the reasons why I did only look at sort of a team and sort of a league-wide approach, I didn't focus on individual players um, was because I sort of wanted to try and smooth over over every player, um, and yeah, sort of sort of mask some of that. Um, but it it is tricky, and I, I think yeah, the tracking data adding as much context to that as possible would help a lot. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Any final questions from our judges? We have maybe time for just one more. All right. Well, Ian, thank you for your tremendous work. We appreciate it. And kudos for working on women's <laughs> hockey. Oh, we do have one question. Just one second. Um, let's see. Um, the question is for you, Ian. Did you differentiate between special teams play and five on five play? Um, my guess is that some clusters would only appear on special teams. And I believe you said that at the beginning. No, or did I? 
misunderstand? Yeah, yeah so I, I only focused on five on five. I think um, having the games that I watched, when the team does have that person advantage, um, the possessions tend to be a bit longer. They tend to keep possession of the puck a bit more. Um, but also some of those passing lanes that aren't there on five on five now exist when there's a, an extra defender missing. Um, so yeah, I, I chose to exclude that um, partly because I thought it would it would influence the results a bit. Um, but that's definitely something that would be really interesting. And also how teams sort of change their passing strategy if they get more aggressive um, on the power play and things like that. So in short, I, I didn't, but um, definitely something interesting to look into. Thank you so much, Ian. Thank you for your work. And we will uh, move on to Mark Richards. Uh, Mark, I'll invite you to join us. And we wanna make sure Mark has the ability to share his screen. Mark is going to be presenting on Moving Beyond Assists, a Bayesian analysis of passing ability. Mark, the Zoom meeting is yours. All right, can you confirm that you can hear me as well as see my slides, please? We can see and hear both. All right, perfect, thank you. All righty. Um, first, I just want to uh, thank Dr. Shuckers, staff leads, Megan, Allison, the judges, everyone involved for putting together this conference and the Big Data Cup, and especially for making it free and accessible to everyone. Uh, I, I really appreciate that. And um, now I'm here to present my Big Data Cup submission, Moving Beyond Assist, a Bayesian Analysis of Passing Ability. So to give you guys a quick introduction of who I am. So as Allison said, my name is Mark Richards. I'm, I'm from Minnesota. I grew up playing hockey. I played Minnesota high school. I went on to play at St. Olaf College where I got an undergraduate degree in mathematics. And then I went on to model natural disasters at Aon for three or four years. And now I'm a PhD student at the Department of Statistics at the University of Pittsburgh. Now that you know I, who I am, we can get into the work. And to, I want you guys to consider kind of two examples to motivate my work. The first here is a Kirill Kaprizov, kind of behind the back, no look maybe um, between the defenders, legs to Matt Zuccarello who misses is a wide open net. Now on the box score, an assist is not recorded for this play. So despite completing a difficult pass and uh, a wide open net, uh, Kaprizov's not credited for that play. On the flip side, we see here, Justin Schultz drops a pass in his own zone to Sidney Crosby, who goes end to end and scores. Justin Schultz receives an, an assist on this play. Now, we can see the contrast in what's awarded assist and what's not. And the, the reason I bring this up is that that's really how we measure passing ability in a lot of leagues. And we've seen this in some of the presentations so far. But the reality is, is most public hockey leagues, you know, going back to Minnesota high school, all the way to junior hockey leagues, and even in the NHL, what's publicly available is really only assists. Some leagues don't even differentiate between primary and secondary assists. And that's ultimately because passing events are not tracked. So in the Big Data Cup, Staff Leads event-based data set actually provided us with tracked passes. As we saw in Ian's great presentation before, we have all the passes for women's hockey and uh, for the Erie Otter, 40 of the Erie Otters games in the 2019-2020 season. So I wanted to move beyond assists and evaluate passing ability of Erie Otters players for the 2019-2020 season. And so to do this, I borrowed work from soccer, specifically the paper, Not All Passes Created Equal by Patrick Lucy, among others. And what we'll do is break it into two parts and how we think about a pass. First is the pass risk, so quantifying easy versus difficult passes. And the second is the reward of the pass, quantifying the scoring chance that's created. You can think that these probably trade off pretty well, right? So difficult passes probably have some relation to the quality of scoring chance. And then ultimately from this, we can create metrics that can maybe give us a better objective measure of a player's passing ability. To, for coaches to evaluate their own team and the Erie Otters, and then as well as professional leagues to kind of scout these players. First, pass risk. We define this as the likelihood of a completed pass. Relatively straightforward, 
we basically, for each pass in the data set, we're assigning some sort of point estimate of a completion probability given factors that might affect whether or not um, making a pass easy or difficult to complete. Now, this work's been done for years now in soccer, I believe, and more recently been made available in the public space, but done by private companies. Um, and that's in the form of an expected completed pass model. So what I did is I used um, Chipman's Bayesian, well, actually a later adaption of it, but a Bayesian added regressive trees BART in order to model this. And so why did I use BART? Well, one, I think uh, we've seen that uh, gradient boosted trees has gotten a little tired in the sports analytics space. So I thought it was a good opportunity to try something else. Although this might be the next kind of sports analytics model. Um, but at any rate, in a serious note, um, the, we've seen in previous research that having like location-based data that ha you have an interaction nature of your independent variables and BART handles this pretty well being a sum of, of, of trees type approach. BART also has strong out of sample performance and gives us a Bayesian framework to work with. To kind of more formal or show the model uh, kind of more as a whole, what we're doing here is we're creating and input data as our you know, matrix X quite simply. And so for each pass, we can think of the common things that associate with completing a pass, right? So the pass distance, angle, you know, um, location of the passer and target, et cetera. And then what we do is we use BART and we come up with a point estimate of a completion probability um, for each pass. Now that we have a completion probability for each pass in our data set, we can kind of get creative and create some metrics to kind of objectively evaluate these players more or less. And so the first metric that I introduced, again, I borrowed some of these ideas from soccer, um, was difficult pass completion percentage. So I arbitrarily define this as a pass that is in the 70th percentile, the most high risk passes. So the idea was to try to get at some of the more difficult passes and see if players like the Capri Soft example, complete those at a higher, higher rate than we'd expect. The other metric is passing plus minus PPM, which is simply the sum of the difference in the completion probability and the er observed outcome of whether or not the pass was completed. So the idea behind this metric is that players with more passing talent would probably compete, complete more passes than you'd expect. And so they would have a higher passing plus minus. The plot on this on the right here shows all situations and on the X axis shows the passing plus minus standard by, standardized by games played. And then the Y axis is the percent of difficult passes completed. I put some notables in red of players that, that stuck out either by name or by where they're located on the chart. Ultimately, you would think you would wanna be in kind of the top right of this chart. Now that we've defined pass risks, we'll move on to reward. Previous research in soccer and hockey defined pass reward as the probability of a goal in the next 10, 20, or 30 seconds. We saw this with Nathan Delara. We've seen it with others. Um, and as well as in soccer, this has been done quite frequently as well. For I, I took a different approach here. I, I defined pass reward as the probability that the score given he scores or the receiver of the pass score is given he shoots the puck. So to model this, we introduce an expected hypothetical goal probability model. And I really borrowed this from what's been done in the NFL by Dishbande and Evans is expected hypothetical completion probability model. And so the idea behind this in their implementation was for wide receivers in NFL games and um, essentially getting a completion probability at different points of a receiver's route, the hypothetical scenarios that the quarterback through it to them at different points. So the first part in this model is just a simple expected goals model using BART. So it's for the observed shots off passes. So when the player that someone passes it to actually shot the puck. The second part is the hypothetical scenario. So it's in instances where a player does not shoot the puck off the pass or shoots it at a different location. Again, I just kind of outline some of the features that are going in and how we can think about an expected goals model. I'm showing this plot here. And again, a lot of these features are, are derived from previous work, especially Evolving Wild. They have a great write-up. 
And so, you know, it's, it's the traditional things, right? The distance of the shot, the angle, um, and we then arrive with a kind of a point estimate for each shot taken in our data set and the goal probability. So now we have a measure for pass reward for the passes where the player, the receiver shot it. But for the hypothetical scenarios, I first wanna try to describe a situation here that can help frame this problem. So here we have a plot of the rank. Uh, the black dot is Jamie Drysdale and he's making a stretch pass to spring Maxime Golod onto a breakaway. Golod catches the pass at the far blue line. And on this play, he actually loses the puck and doesn't get a shot off. So we don't actually have a reward for his pass or have where he shot it because he didn't shoot it. So we need to figure out how we can come up with an estimate. So if we fix his location at the point he caught the pass, we can see that, well, we know that he, would, he was on a breakaway and likely would have shot it closer. So we're probably gonna underestimate the goal probability or our XG on this. So to kind of get around this, we can kind of sample um, a bunch of different points of time where he could have gone. And then we can you know, average that out to account for some of these hypothetical scenarios and kind of more or less get, get around the uncertainty of a player, you know, shooting a puck at a different location. To kind of put this framed a little different. And so for each pass where we don't have an observed shot off of it, we essentially have two sets of covariates we need to deal with. So these are the inputs into an expected goals model and the observed covariates are what we're gonna have for every pass. And then the unobserved covariates, namely being the shot location, are the ones that we need to try to figure out what they should be for a player in order to get pass reward. So what we can do here is we can sample the unobserved covariates from the instances of passes where we had a shot off the pass. We can average across that and we can get an, a point estimate for the expected hypothetical goal probability. And so ultimately this gives us a pass reward for each pass in our data set. Now that we've got pass reward, we can start to come up with some metrics. And some of the metrics that I've introduced, again, are, are things that have been borrowed from other sports. The first is, is quite simple and it's just expected assists. So it's defined only for shots off passes as the probability that the receiver scores. So their expected goals. And then the other is expected hypothetical assist. So it's the point estimate of the hypothetical probability that the targeted player scores after he receives the pass. And the plot here shows all situations. And on the x-axis, it shows the primary assist per game. And on the y-axis, it shows the expected assist per game. There's a one-to-one -one line in black. So players that are above the line, they have less assists than we'd expect and then players below the line have more assists than we would expect. So now that we have kind of created some metrics and defined pass reward and pass risk, you know, we can start, we can aggregate these over the season and kind of see which players came out. So which players were the most accurate? Uh, Luke Beamish stood out, although um, he did play a low sample of games and we measure maybe pass accuracy by some of our pass risk metrics. And then pass reward gives us something along the lines of which passers drove the most value. And we see Jamie Drysdale as um, coming out towards the top. And he was the number six pick in the 2018 draft for those unfamiliar. So it's probably good to see someone like that coming around up top. And then lastly, while we can use these metrics and aggregate them, the, the other way we can kind of start to think about it is visualizing these on a rink. And so I borrowed from um, a, a soccer analysis that plotted expected assists and passes. And so that's what we do here. So this plot shows Jamie Drysdale's all of his offensive zone passes. Each dot represents a location of a pass and colored in yellow are passes that had kind of a high probability of a goal. And then there's an underlying heat map. So the light spots represent the locations of areas he passed to a lot of the time. So 
in this instance, Drysdale is a defenseman, and you can see a lot of the passes are at the point, and particularly the right point, and then the white spots in the left point. So he's probably going D to D quite a bit, which I think intuitively makes sense. Um, now, I think you can definitely do a bit more work in slice and dice these for different situations and, and stuff, and maybe start to understand patterns of passing for, for different players. So every kind of analysis has some improvements and other things to consider. So I, I had some that I just wanted to highlight here that I think are good for future work. First, as I think everyone in all of their big data cup submissions has talked about, uh, complete tracking data with the location of defenders. It's, that's what we always want, right? Publicly available tracking data. So um, that would obviously be helpful in definitely in quantifying the probability of a completed pass if the guy's open or not. Second, all OHL games and previous seasons. So we, as this has kind of been talked about, but 50% of our basically data is trained off just the Erie Otters. So we probably have some sort of bias. We also don't have a good sense for how these metrics compare across teams. Like it's tough to make sense of them when you're, you're pretty much isolated on one team. And then I think lastly, for previous seasons, if I was working for a team in a professional league, I would want to know like how well previously some of these metrics kind of have translated to, to other leagues. Next, I'd say refinement of simulating of the unobserved covariate. So what we did here is we sampled from the empirical distribution of the ones we did observe. And I think you could use an imputation method or some other approach and spend some more time ironing that out to get to get a better estimate there. And then also, while making a pass is a skill, catching a pass is also a skill. So I think you could do something similar with exploring the ability to catch a pass. And on that note, what we didn't really do in this analysis or completely do is actually account for individual player effects. Now, maybe that's in some sort of random effect for each player. If we're saying the ability to catch a pass is a skill, um, you probably want to make some, some sort of adjustment. It's probably a tricky problem, but I, I think eventually you'd want to account for that in some fashion. And then lastly, I think a team level analysis of the importance of this metrics would be interesting um, to understand kind of just at a team level how this drives winning and, and whatnot. So that's all I had for my presentation and I'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Mark. I'll invite our judges to join us with any questions that they might have. Uh, I guess I, I can start, Mark. Um, I guess my, my one uh, major question that I kind of had when I read the paper originally, um, where did the 70th percentile come from? And did you think about trying to justify that in, in some way based on the data itself? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Because as I said, it was arbitrary. Um, so I think in the, the not all passes created equal paper, they use like the 75th. And, you know, I don't really have a good answer to it other than I was trying to just get, like, I think, you know, enough difficult passes. Um, I'm not really confident to say that the 70th percentile is what you would want to use. Um, it was just kind of, can we get enough where we're, we don't have like 10 passes? We're getting more like, you know, 100 for, for the players that are shown. Um, I, I think you could... Once you get more players, I think you get a, or sorry, more games in the data, you could get a, maybe a better sense for that. So I, I don't have a good justification why I chose that idea. Yeah, it's still a fair answer though. I mean, it's a limited sample set. So, I, you know, and it, it, it bucketed it properly, get kept your sample sizes large enough and, you know, is what it is. Hey, Mark. Uh... Enjoy the presentation. I have a question. I just wanted to double check my understanding of the uh, um, expected hypothetical assist formula. So is this like the probability of a goal from a particular location times the probability of that player going to that location? 
Um, so no, it's basically like, well, wait, can you repeat what you what you said the formula was? You said, is it like, um, are you take are you so for the hypothetical assist, you're you're basically taking some average over a bunch of possible locations that the shot could come from, right? So is this yep. Uh, the probability of scoring a goal from each of those locations times the probability of getting to that location? No, it's, I'm not doing anything with like the probability of actually getting to that location. Um, so basically it's, we, we sample the, the covariate. So basically like, you know, if we go back to this example, um, you know, being at this location or that location and, you know, we draw say 500 or whatever number you have, and then you're just averaging the probability, the expected goals across all of those. Okay. So, yeah, I, I think that there's definitely a bit more work you could do to um, maybe do better at in imputing it, or yeah, I guess you could somewhat account for the probability they get to each location in some sense too. Um, maybe an imputation method of the observed unobserved covariates would would kind of get you there too. Um, I have to think about it a bit more. So is, when you're doing the sample, is it maybe it's contained in the sampling somehow? Like when you're doing the sampling, are you sampling from um, something that's conditioned on where the past came from or something like that? Right. So so what I what I sample is Basically, for like location, it's the change in like where they went from X and Y, oh. like the observed passes. So then you kind of back into the X and Y location that way. So you're not sampling like the X from a player, a defensive D to D zone when you're in the offensive zone sort of thing. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Thanks. So, so, so Mark, how did how did the stepping work? And like, is there an end point there like near the net, like where you, you can't go past that point or something like how, as far as generating the, the, the XG for this? Yeah. Yep. Very good point. Yep. So you, I basically just, I put a cap. So if you draw a sample of a player moving, you know, certain far in the X and Y, then you, you cut it off at, I mean, I forget what the coordinates are like 200, you know, the end of the rink and the top and the bottom of the rink. So you just, you would basically say they went to the boards or in that scenario. And does it go towards the center of the net? Like if you start, if, if this pass was made, you know, to where the face off dot is it there in the neutral zone, like, is it going towards the net or is it going straight forward? Like in the X coordinate? Um, so, so you're sampling the change in the X and the change in the Y. So, so, yeah, I mean, you could sample a scenario where he goes backwards because that happens because there's a defenseman there. We don't know. Um, so, you, so you sample X and Y, and so that kind of gives you where, where they were or the change in it. So it, it'll give them where they were going then, too, in some sense. Okay, thank you. Okay, so to follow up on that, so you're just showing a few example locations here. They, they, like these uh, these – there are other dots at different Y's, in other words. Right. Yes, this is just to kind of frame the hypothetical of how in this instance, if you fix where he was located as what you're going to feed into your expected goals, then you'd probably, you know, be underestimating it or, you know, you know, there's, there's other scenarios that could happen. So it was just a, an example. Um, but yes, there would be more dots, significantly more than four. Okay, great, thanks. All right, great. Uh, one last call for any questions from our judges after a good solid round there. All right, well, Mark, tremendous presentation. Thank you for your work here. Um, we appreciate you coming and joining us along with our other three finalist groups. With that, I will thank everyone who attended. I would like to thank all of our judges as well. And I will turn it over to Megan to conclude our evening. 
Yes, and I agree with Allison. Huge thanks to everyone, the judges, the presenters, and even the Mighty Ducks for getting an Australian in here this evening. It was absolutely wonderful to see hockey spread across the world. Also, I hear you about the data constraints. I'm actually going to send a survey after, so I have some evidence to leagues teams you know, for the next Big Data Cup. I certainly had a call on some goodwill for this one, but I hope it opens the eyes of the benefits of public events like this. And please use the women's data so I have more requests for it as well. Thanks to Mike Lopez and the NFL for sitting, you know, the bar so high for us uh, and for the huge inspiration. I know we can give you more and better data. So great feedback in the presentations. And I look forward to having more evidence to move forward. Tomorrow starts bright and early. You're stuck with me at 10 a.m. in the morning and the final winners are announced end of day tomorrow. As well, we will see the college finalists and some of the honorable mentions in the poster uh, hour. So we invite you all to join us for that as well. Thanks again, everyone. Great first Big Data Cup and have a wonderful night.